Well, thanks everyone for coming. Um, if you're here uh, right today, right now, then I, I'm guessing that uh, you've either got at least a little bit of a sense that maybe, just maybe, uh, cryptography is actually kind of cool. Uh, either that or maybe you already know in your heart of hearts, but either way. Um, but maybe you're put off by the fact that it can be a very uh, forbidding field uh, to kind of dive into. Uh, a lot of times what you'll hear is that, hey, crypto's hard. Um, uh, don't roll your own crypto. You know, basically all these non-inviting messages that say don't get involved. Um, and that's really not the way it ought to be. So what I'd like to do today is I want to take you through a, uh, a whirlwind tour of about 2,500 years worth of cryptography history. Um, and help put some of the, uh, the basics of this field into historical context. Um, make them a little bit more accessible so maybe you can come away with uh, a better understanding or knowing where you might want to get involved with, uh, with cryptography. Uh, first about me, my name is Eric Cole. Uh, I am a senior security analyst. I used to be uh, an, uh, the information security manager for my company, but uh, I'm working remote because, see there, I'm kind of in Knoxville, I'm kind of in Louisville, I'm, trying to sell a house and I've got, you know, more rent and mortgage payments than I know what to do with right now. So, um, I first encountered crypto when I was working as a developer and I was implementing it, uh, which is, should be terrifying because I had no idea what I was doing. Uh, and since I moved into security, uh, I had the opportunity to start working with it in a broader sense um, and really diving uh, deeper into what was involved. Um, and that became more of a choice than, became, than, than a career necessity. And I'm also a little bit of a history buff, which meshes with this surprisingly well. So let's start at the beginning, right? Uh, so you've come to talk about crypto, so you've obviously got some idea of what crypto is. Uh, but the essence of it is that you've got some information that you want to keep confidential, and you want to make sure that no one tampers with it. You've put value on that information. Uh, and you need to get it to, you need to do something with it. You need to give it to someone in a way that's unchanged and private uh, by anybody else. So you need the troops to march east and not west. You need that assassination attempt to occur at exactly three in the morning, not four. Uh, I need to buy the Borgias on Blu-ray and not Fifty Shades of Grey. Uh, so one way or another, whatever you call it, it's a secret, right? And it needs to be a useful secret. And crypto is how we do that. So before we proceed, I want to introduce you to Alice and Bob. Now, people teaching anything about crypto will routinely use Alice and Bob as a model for demonstrating these primitives. Alice needs to send a message to Bob, and they need to keep Eve from eavesdropping. And you know, this can be a very informative way of demonstrating uh, crypto principles. Um, but it kind of sucks. It's very boring, it's very dry, and it's really out of touch with what's, kind of, with what's going on in the real world scenarios that are actually uh, in play here. To make the origin of crypto come to life, we need to focus on where crypto intersects with stories. <coughs> what is the story? What do they do to protect that information? What do they invent? And how did that impact the outcome of their situation? You can leverage that relationship to give you a cleaner understanding of these fundamentals. So our story begins here in Greece, in the 4th century BC. Darius I, who was also called Darius the Great, uh, who if you're familiar with civilization, uh, that would be this guy. Not a bad faction, actually. He was emperor of Persia. Uh, and he was actually really upset with the Greeks because the Greeks had this habit of meddling in all the Persian affairs along the, uh, it was the Ionic coast. It's the pretty much western coast that you see there facing uh, Europe. Um, so in 492 BC, Darius launched an invasion of Greece. Now at first, rough seas turned him back, and so he tried diplomacy to get through to the Greeks just how upset he was. Uh, and that uh, ended predictably. So he tried his invasion uh, approach a second time. Uh, this time it was much more successful. So right from the get-go, he sacked the city-state of Eritrea. You can see it there. That's the, it's the top yellow pin there. Uh, and so wanting to continue on that success, he was going for Athens next. 
uh, Athens is inland, so he needed to land at the city. He needed to land somewhere to actually march to Athens to attack it. So he landed at Marathon. And that's where the Greeks engaged them. Now, the Greeks had fewer soldiers. They were caught by surprise, despite the fact that they you know, just went and executed the, uh, the Persian ambassador who came through town. Uh, but they did fight with superior tactics. So they were able to uh, succeed in driving off the Persians and turning back the invasion. Now, from this marathon, you might gather, this is where we get the legend of Pheidippides, who was that herald who, uh, rather mythologically, uh, ran all the way from Marathon, all the way back to Athens to deliver news of that victory, and only to collapse and die as soon as he got there. Just interesting side note in, on the, in the way of stories. Now, despite the fact that he was defeated at Marathon, Darius's campaign in the Aegean was actually extremely successful. Uh, he, had, uh, not, he, he had not only uh, sacked Eritrea, they got a lot of spoils, um, and they gained a lot of territory in Greece. So he intended to return and finish the job, but he actually died of old age before he could get around to it. So it fell to his son, Xerxes I, to, to finish his conquest of Greece. All right. The Greeks were warned that Xerxes was going to be coming, right? Now, Sparta. Sparta has a rather unique form of government. They actually had two kings. Uh, Demaratus was one of them. Uh, he, was, uh, he had been deposed and exiled by one of his rivals. So what he did is, this is prior to the, the first invasion, he fled to Persia, uh, and he joined the court of uh, Darius and became an ally to both Darius and the Xerxes. So we don't know whether it was to warn his uh, countrymen, or whether it was to gloat over, ha, 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 look what's coming to get you guys. But what he did is he took uh, folding wax tablets, basically, so you could just kind of close it. It's like an old, an ancient iPad, you could think of it that way. Mm -hmm. He scraped all the wax off of it, because that's how they would, you know, use, uh, that, that's what they would do for disposable writing substances. Scraped all the wax on it, and then he carved his message into the wood that was the backing for it. Then he had the wax melted and poured back on so it looked like it was brand spanking new. And then he sent this tablet over to Sparta, just completely blank. Now, Leonidas' wife, Gorgo, was the first one to realize that there was something more to this gift than met the eye. So she had her countrymen scrape all that wax off, and lo and behold, hey, here's this message that says you're about to have a, a Persian whore descend on your country. Now, because of this warning, the Spartans were able to muster a small defense force. They, 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 uh, uh, King Leonidas himself led a contingent of, rather famously, 300 Spartan hoplites, uh, and less famously, about 4,000 other Greek forces. They weren't alone in that, despite what the movies will tell you, uh, against the much larger uh, Persian army. So they engaged the Persians at a choke point in Thermopylae, up here. Now Xerxes' army uh, prevailed after seven days of fighting, but it was a Pyrrhic victory. Uh, the historians' estimates, estimates put Persian losses at about 10 to 1 versus, versus the Greeks. Now after that, though, the Persians did march through and they conquered a great amount of territory in northern Greece, uh, while the rest of Greece uh, scrambled to rally their defensive forces. Eventually, the Athenians were able to provoke a naval battle at Salamis here, and smash the, the, the vast host of uh, Persians' uh, naval forces. Uh, the whole of Greece then put together a massive hoplite force uh, and destroyed the remainder of their forces out there in Plataea, the, the yellow pin right there in the center. Uh, expelling Xerxes and, and Persia completely from the territory at that point. So this is a great example, uh, a great early example of steganography or hidden messages. Uh, which is really the first family of classic crypto. It's also the weakest form of crypto because it, its success uh, hinges entirely on being clever. And that can be undone by a vigilant enemy or even sheer dumb luck. And the Spartans understood that. And so they actually sought to improve upon their methods. In Plutarch's biography of the Spartan, Admiral Lysander, he describes how important and secret messages would be dispatched to their generals. They would take a leather strap, and I'll have an, uh, an illustration for this in a moment. They took a leather strap and they would wind it around a baton 
of a very precise diameter, right? They would write their message on that strap, and then when they unwound it, all the letters would then be scrambled. So if this were intercepted, no one would be able to figure out exactly what they said. Uh, they would then also sometimes combine this with a little bit of steganography. They might take that leather strap and then tuck it inside the messenger's belt, so they would have to be thoroughly searched to even find it in the first place. So what they would do is, if this were the ribbon, let's pretend that doesn't break and it actually bends. Sorry, this is power. This is a uh, PowerPoint. I can only do so much. They would wind it around the ski tower, the, the baton, like this. All right. Now you see how the uh, the letters here are going to line up to spell our message. Send more hoplites to Megara. Megara is another city state in Greece. So notice how okay every fourth character here is going to line up on that top row. I'm really good with PowerPoint. Now the innovation we see here is that this is a big shift from hiding messages to obfuscating the content of the message. The Skitale is really a simple machine. I mean, it's a really simple machine. It's just a baton. And anyone who knows this technique can, once, you, once you've seen this in, in action, you can figure it out if you then intercepted the message. All you really need to do at that point is figure out, well, how thick was the baton? You can experiment with that and get it, you know, figure that out without having, knowing the precise diameter in advance. So because of these weaknesses, it really never did catch on outside of Spartan. But honestly, this was the best we had for several hundred years. Right up until we meet this guy, Gaius Julius Caesar. Now, many people may not realize that this Caesar was never actually emperor. And in 58 BC, he was actually proconsul, which is a provincial governor. Um, in order to curry political favor and to uh, fill his coffers with gold, because at this point he's really, really deep in debt, um, he decided he would go to the Senate and say, hey, would you guys let me declare war on Gaul? They've attacked us a few times. We clearly don't like that, so let me go to war with these guys. It'll be great, because it'll be great for me, because the people will love me, and I'm going to get a bunch of money on this. And in fact, it was a total victory for Caesar. After eight years of campaigns, uh, in Gaul, uh, Rome would eventually annex the entire territory, uh, and this paved the way for, for Caesar to become the sole ruler, but not yet emperor, uh, of Rome. Now, despite all that success, he didn't win every battle. One of these defeats was in 53 BC near Tongres, which is in modern-day Belgium. A legion of the Roman army was bunkered down for winter, and food was scarce for both Roman and for the Gaul Gauls, the Gaelic. Uh, under the command of Ambiorix, I'm sorry, some of these names are tricky and I just trip right over them. Under the command of Ambiorix, uh, a Gaelic tribe attacked the Romans over a grain shipment. Um, when they withdrew, Ambiorix came out and said, hey guys, whoa, sorry, that, you know, this, things are really tense, food is scarce, you know, but you guys really should be worried right now because there's this huge uh, force of German troops that is coming to reinforce us and you really guys you need to get out of here and the Romans believed this so the following morning they were in a in a mad rush to break camp when what happens but uh, the Gauls come in and ambush them massacre them so riding high on this victory they decide hey we're on a roll let's keep it going so they then go and surround the nearby camp of, of uh, Quintus Tullius Cicero who was actually the bro brother to the uh, order if you've ever heard the name Cicero before this was his little brother. <laughs> now Cicero got a message out to Caesar, a message that really didn't require any encryption. Help me. Right? Now Cicero, or sorry, Caesar got that message, so he raised two whole legions to come help. Now he needs to get a message back to Cicero to say, hold tight, we're on the way, don't do anything stupid. Because he's surrounded, remember? He's, you know, got all these warriors sitting around outside his camp, and he's itching going, should we, like, attack? Go out in a blaze of glory? So Caesar bribes a, uh, a Gaul to ride ahead with a message. But he needs to be careful because he doesn't want it to be intercepted. He doesn't want uh, Ambiorix to know what's going on. So what he does is he decides to write the message in Greek characters. It's in his own language, but it's written with Greek characters. 
Now, the rider was instructed to throw the message into camp by spear if he couldn't get close enough to deliver it by hand. And that's exactly what he ended up doing. So he ties it around the spear, and he chucks it into camp, and it gets stuck. And no one notices it for two days. I mean, when we think about the pressures of war, <clears throat> that's amazing that in two days' time, that message is just sitting there. No one actually notices it. He might have got, done something stupid and said, hey, why don't we try a tactical retreat? Get slaughtered. You know, but they do eventually see it. They bring it down. They give it to Cicero. And he discovers, hey, help is on the way. I need to hold tight. This is one of the first known examples of what we would call a monoalphabetic substitution cipher. That's a mouthful. But basically, it's just saying you've only got one alphabet. It's a table that translates your original alphabet to an enciphered alphabet. You scramble up one. Now, he did a simple, he used a simple, uh, we'll call it a symbolic substitution. Because he's not really necessarily, he's not even scrambling letters at all. Uh, this mechanism would have been immediately apparent to Cicero, who had knowledge of the Greeks, but not to the Gauls. If they intercepted it, the Gaelic tribes had no interaction with Greece whatsoever. They would have looked at this and said, what is this garbage? So it doesn't really provide any additional security, using symbols instead of other letters, that is. Um, if, for instance, he needed to keep this message a secret from other Romans. And that's something that we see when we're talking about symbolic ciphers throughout history. Uh, Geoffrey Chaucer, the guy there on the left, he was known for inserting enciphered paragraphs into his work, I guess kind of as a little challenge, a little bit of, haha, look how smart I am. But every single one of those has, has been uh, decrypted, and he never published uh, the, his cipher. He never published that table. On the right there, you have Mary Queen of Scots. She's uh, notable for being one of the very first people to have lost her life as a direct result of the failure of cryptography. She had a symbolic nomenclature there, and we'll come back to that and what that means, um, that was defeated by English spies. And those spies were able to then prove her complicity in a plot to assassinate uh, Queen Elizabeth. And then they took her head off. Perhaps one of the best known symbolic ciphers comes from uh, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, in his 1898 Sherlock Holmes novel, uh, the, Adventure, the Adventure of the Dancing Man. In the modern age, symbol substitutions are toys. Uh, we'll, we'll look at a couple of recent video games here. Well, recent in the last few years. The original Dead Space, for instance. Uh, the artist included in cipher graffiti that they put all around this space station that's, uh, that, that, that you're exploring. Uh, and a solution, basically a Rosetta Stone, was actually included. At one point, if you were looking around, paying attention to the environment, you would see this. Uh, so some fans took this and cleaned it up, and so once you had this, you could then walk around this space station and read what people had scrawled in, in blood, which all of them are very fun messages to say, please get me out of here. Uh, another game, Fez, an indie darling game, uh, took a very different approach. They created an invented language, so to speak, that used only six <coughs> symbols, but included rotation as a factor to get the, the necessary number of characters out of it. So there's a solution for that one. Um, and really, the central weakness of these symbolic ciphers is really is right here on the screen. Once you have this, once you've been able to work out what the solution is, it doesn't matter that you're using symbols and not letters. You haven't really given yourself any additional security. Now, coming back to Caesar, later in his life, he would then improve on his uh, monoalphabetic uh, cipher. And he, would, he invented a shifted alphabet. In this case, A would go to D, B would go to E, and so on and so forth. Um, you can think of it as a, as a rot three in modern terms. This was the cipher that would later bear his name, the Caesar shift. So here we have you know, the, the, the classical example. Uh, with plain text on the top, and that's through these tables, that's generally how I'm going to uh, uh, show it. The plain text would be on top, and there's what the cipher, the corresponding cipher letter would be. So if that message he wanted to send to Cicero before was do not abandon camp, this is how he would have enciphered it with his Rot 3 Caesar shift. Now I, I mentioned, I call it a Rot 3 as well, because there's a special case 
uh, in the modern age that um, you might have heard some folks talk about. You may know this story. Rot 13. Well, we have 26 letters. Rot 13 is a special case because being exactly halfway through, it's symmetrical. A goes to N, and N goes back to A. Now, we have a little bit of a, a we have a much more recent story where it comes to Rot 13. Uh, you might recall back in 2001 when the, the concept of an ebook was new. Adobe was one of the first companies trying to capitalize on this, and so they released this SDK uh, out to a whole bunch of different ebook vendors saying, hey, figure out how to make money off of selling electronic books. Well, one of the uh, uh, rights management examples that they included was a ROT13 example. Unfortunately, a lot of these ebook vendors didn't see it as an example, they just used it. So vendors were putting out ebooks that were encrypted with ROT13, which is something that any text editor, like a basic text editor, can beat. Now you have this Russian company called Elcomsoft. Most of what they did were, were password cracking tools. Uh, so they put out actually utility and say, look how dumb this is, guys. We can crack these ROT13 encrypted ebooks, no problem. He was actually, uh, the developer was actually arrested. In, so he's from Russia, so he, at one point he flew in like for, for DEF CON or Black Hat or something. He was actually arrested and he was arraigned of the DMCA. Uh, in a press release, Apple inferred that the tool he wrote was, and I'm quoting here, a determined illegal attack. It's ROT13. A goes to N, A goes to A, okay? Now fortunately the courts disagreed with Apple, so he was acquitted in December of 2002 after just a two-week trial. In fact, at that point, he wasn't even in the country. The courts were so, found this so ridiculous. They said, uh, just go home. Just go home. <laughs> so he was, he was acquitted in absentia. Now later on, Caesar's technique of the shift would be further improved. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm hesitant to use the word improved. It was uh, be modified to include a key phrase, to make it a little bit easier to remember. Uh, so the way this would work is a, a word or a phrase would be agreed upon by the, the sender and the, send and the recipient in advance. So let's say that uh, Caesar wants to send a Cicero. We're going to use Cicero's name, Quintus Tullius Cicero. They're going to take that name, reduce it down to unique letters, and then they're going to start off the cipher alphabet, the second row, with those unique letters. Once you run out of the unique letters, you just fill in the rest with whatever's left. So A, B, D, F, G. HJ, so on and so forth. <clears throat> now it's very, very easy to remember. You don't need any kind of a table, and you can re reproduce it on the fly if you, you know, lose your notes, as long as you remember that key. Uh, but what you cost is that right here at the end, some of your, your, your lesser used later letters, um, they don't get substituted at all. Now maybe that's a problem, maybe that's not. Depends on if, if your message is going to have a lot of V, W, X, Y, and Z in it. So to continue moving forward through time, I want to stop and think about Greece for just a second here. Have you ever wondered why Greece, ancient and classical Greece, manages to capture our attention so much? Why is it so enduring? It's not the oldest civilization that we know about. So why is it that it continues to influence pop culture for the young and old, even millennia after its decline? I mean, the truth is, the works of the, Greek, of the Greeks were almost, in fact, completely lost to us. The Romans were well acquainted with the Greeks. They were neighbors. But as the Roman Empire fell into decline, so did Europe's, Europe's, Europe, Europe? Europe's knowledge of the Greek language. And when Rome fell in 476 AD and ushered in the Dark Ages, many Greek texts had not been translated into Latin. So who did we get them from? Well, in the 8th century, Al-Mansur was the head of the Abbasid Caliphate. He founded the city of Baghdad near the, con the, uh, the, the conquered city of Testifan uh, in modern-day Iraq, after all the great conquests of Islam in that period subsided. He founded a library. Oh, sorry. There's, there's the Abbasid Empire. He founded a library there called Bayit al-Hikmah, or the House of Wisdom. And this began what we know of now as the Islamic Golden Age. Literature, philosophy, math, science, these are the things that poured out of the Islamic world and made an incredible and lasting impact on the world. Bayit al-Hikmah was central to that activity. 
So here is where scholars would bring all the books they could find, sometimes at huge premiums, at huge cost. They would bring it here and translate it to Arabic. Now this love of knowledge became infectious for, and lasted for centuries. 200 years later, uh, in the 10th century, uh, Al-Hakam, uh, the uh, leader of uh, Muslim Spain, he founded libraries throughout all of Muslim Spain and brought those Arabic books there. Under his leadership, the city of Toledo, which is pretty much right in the center of the green section there, became emerged as an important intellectual center. Mathematics and engineering were taught to some of the same people who then went on to build uh, Europe's great Christian cathedrals. That's where they learned about Euler. That's where they learned about that kind of architecture. By the 12th century, Raymond, the Archbishop of, the Archbishop of Toledo, he founded his own school of translators, this time to start translating Arabic books back into Latin. So for the first time in seven centuries, Europe could now peer into uh, the minds of a civilization that it had not encountered. But knowledge of this history isn't the only thing that the Islamic Golden Age gave to crypto. One of the important concentrations at Ba'it al-Hikmah was the Hadith. Now most people know that the Quran is, uh, is, is the primary holy text of Islam. Uh, Muslims believe it to be Allah's revelation to the Prophet Muhammad. Uh, and its name literally means the recitation. The Hadith, however, are a secondary collection of Muhammad's teachings and some sayings. Uh, they're oral tradition. So they're not held as directly divine, but they're very important to Islamic jurisprudence. Uh, so when you hear about muftis issuing fatwas, even, even today, these are formal theological interpretations that come from the Quran, yes, but also the Hadith, the hadith that whichever sect this person speaks for maintains. Since it was oral tradition, it was uh, important to study the use of language. Uh, how did Muhammad say certain things at different points in his life? They needed that information to be able to say, he said that in this year. So they could say, yes, he taught that, and then five years later he reversed it. Right? So what they did is they studied the frequency of certain words in Muhammad's life, and they didn't stop there. They then went on to study this, uh, how frequently did certain uh, letters appear in those words. It kind of became one of the very first big data projects. So let me ask you a quick question. What are the most common uh, letters in the English language? E-A-R-S-T-L-M-E-T-H. He got it back there, right? Wheel of Fortune has definitely taught us that R-S-T-L-M-E is, is in there. Now, th now those are all in there. Um, I heard some other ones that are absolutely correct. Uh, if you were playing Wheel of Fortune, what should your, in, in the final round, what should your four letters be? Anyone? Well, I would go with H, D, C, and A. So here you got on the right, you have a frequency chart. Um, you might not be able to see this down here, but you can take my word for it. H, D, C, and A. So I'll introduce you to Al-Kindi, who he was a philosopher and a polymath who uh, was a prominent figure at that Bayit al -Hikma. So in addition to being, in addition to being a translator uh, of Greek text into Arabic, uh, he also had a reputation for promoting Greek philosophy and adapting that uh, into the uh, Muslim world. <coughs> But he was also known as the father of cryptanalysis. He outlined a technique that leveraged this broad understanding they were developing of letter frequency into a technique that would defeat a substitution cipher. So let's try it. All right. On the top left, we have a sample cipher text that I've prepared for you. On the bottom, we've got an empty chart that, in the lowercase letters, those are our cipher letters. So if I say cipher A, I'm talking about a lowercase a. Okay, we're going we're gonna to track our progress as we go ahead right now and, and, and uh, encrypt this message. <clears throat> On the right, in the brown box here, we have, I've computed the frequency of letters in that sample. And in the green box, we have, that's the same data that I showed you on this chart back here. It's just this ordering right here. What's the, the master frequency of English letters? So we're going to start by going with a couple easy guesses. We're just going to start at the top of the green box. So our very first guess is that our lowercase u is going to be plain text e. Okay? Just using pure frequency for our first couple of guesses. 
All right, we'll grab the next one from the top. Should be pretty safe. We're going to guess that cipher O, lowercase o, is going to be T, right up here. And as you can see, as I'm revealing these, I'm capitalizing letters in that main body text there. All right, now I don't want to just go down the frequency chart. We've got a really small sample of text here. We might not be able to rely on that master frequency. So let's change tactics a little bit. Let's look for common little words in the English language. There's lots of them. A, an, is, or. The. The. And that's the one that should be jumping out at you right now. Yeah. <laughs> what do you think the odds are that that's not the word the? Probably very low. So we're going to guess that cipher Y is H. And hey, look, that does happen to line up directly with our frequency. We got lucky on that one. All right. Well, let's look at um, more little words. So I want to start with little words that start with A, and here's why. What are some little words that start with A? A, and, and and. That's great because not only are they three little words, one, but you also get a one, two, three progression. So let's step through it. Uh, let's look for one character uh, little words in our text. Oh, it's, sorry, it may or may not be F. There we go. All right, look for two, two character little words to start with that. We got a lot more of those. All right, now I'm going to go ahead and drop a couple of these out. I'm going to drop out there in the purple on the right. Why? Because if, if, that, were, if that lower cipher R were A, then the word would be A-E. It's <coughs> probably nonsense. I'm going to drop out in the green for the exact same reason. That would be A-E, nonsense. All right, so we got a dark blue, we got a light blue, and red. All right, let's expand this. Where do we see three letter words that start with those, the same cipher letters? All right, that's a pretty clear indicator that we probably are looking at um, cipher F, lower F is probably gonna be our letter A. All right, now, we talked about that progression, right? Well, there's our two and three letter words, right? So we're gonna guess that cipher D is gonna be the letter N, and cipher Q is going to be the letter D. So we've got A, N, and ant. All right, starting to look pretty good. All right, so now let's go. Uh, we had a bunch of those blue boxes on the screen a few uh, a moment ago. Those are likely to be words that start with either O or, or I, right? Just, just thinking about little words, they probably start with vowels, <coughs> many of them do. Um, so let's just kind of go with an intuitive one. <coughs> We're going to try a guess here. It's not going to be right, but we'll try it. So I'm going I'm to start by saying, here's all those blue boxes. I'm sorry. We're going to start by guessing that cipher A is going to be the letter O. Okay? So I've got it in red there because we're going to have to back out of this. All right. What about two letter words now? All right. There's three of them on there. So that could be on, it could be or, and it could be of. Well, if you look down there on the right, you've got two right next to one another. It's unlikely to be of, on, the. That's a weird way of saying anything. So let's, but it could be or, on, the. So let's guess that cipher M is going to be R, and that cipher N is going to be F. All right. Now we screwed up here. That didn't work. We got a couple words that are clearly looking like nonsense now. So what I'm going to do is we're going to back out those changes. My original hypothesis was that cipher A was O, so we're going to flip it. What if cipher A is I? All right, let's look at those little words again. We got three different little words, right? One of them is in, the other is going to be is and if, right? Well, let's look at the cipher chart there, and we can just make a probable guess. Or it's not the cipher chart, sorry, the frequency chart. S is a lot more frequent than F, so the one that occurs a lot more frequently is probably the word is, rather than the word if. So we're going to guess that cipher M is S, and that cipher N is F. All right. Now let's wrap up with our little words. We're, we're making some good progress now. So this one here, this guy's not likely to be OS. I mean, I'm kind of writing this in a period... In a, in, a, in, a, in a period piece, so this is those, as though uh, Caesar were writing it. It's not going to be us. Um, it's probably us. So we're going to guess that cipher P is U. All right, now we've got 
This one's probably going to be the word two, so let's guess that cipher G's out. All right, making progress. We've got some more little words here. This could be out, it could be or, but since the next word is looks like it's probably position, I have the second word in the, in the whole thing there. Um, so let, it's, it's probable that cipher K is R, and that makes sense with this, because if cipher K is R, then that's four and not something like font. All right, at this point, we've got a good body of uh, the thing translated. So I'm just going to step through this very quickly here, and I'm not reading it out one at a time. But what I've done is, as I went through this, I would look at a word that had only one letter missing, and I could guess what the word was, and I filled it in. And you can see more and more letters filling in. It gets easier and easier as you fill them in. So at this point, I've just filled in the last one. At this point, now we can see the entire message. It's, the message reads well and it makes sense. So I think we've managed to use frequency analysis here to appropriately decrypt that text. Now let's invert that cipher table real quick. So I've got now the, the cipher on top, ordered for ordered by the alphabet. You, you can see it looks like I used a, uh, a keyed Caesar cipher. Uh, and the key is frequency analysis to actually uh, create that sample. Now this technique proved ex incredibly effective. So cryptographers had to, cut to, had to fight back. Um, so they used double and null characters. A null character would be something inserted into the cipher text that translates to nothing. It doesn't have a meaning, you just drop it out. Uh, a double character, if you're saying the word noon, uh, then you would say, for instance, N O double N. So it just says that the preceding character or the next character, depends, depends on how you work it out, should be doubled. And what that does is it introduces, both of those introduce false uh, characters into the cipher text that if you were to count up the frequency of those, it would throw off that analysis. Uh, they would use deliberate misspellings, the original lead speak. Uh, they would use codes. So instead of doing uh, a cipher at all, they would just say, well, you know, this word is this number, this word is this number, and you build up a code book. Well, the problem is that if you ever lose that code book to the enemy, your code is shot. There's no security to it anymore. And your vocabulary is limited by what you agreed to put into it in the first place. And nomenclators, which were a, bl a blend, I mentioned one earlier, it would be a cipher where you had some, those little words would in fact be replaced with their own symbol. So instead of using that word the that was so easy it jumped out of its right away, you would have a symbol for the word the. It really makes things more challenging. Interestingly enough, code books are still in use today. They are. We'll come back to that too. And this was the state of, of affairs in cryptography for a while, and it's a pretty grim picture. <laughs> grim picture. <laughs> so, so. All right. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, so throughout Europe at this point, the monarchs are now in the, in the, uh, getting in the habit of, of hiring their own cryptographers to protect their messages and to defeat the ciphers of their rivals, um, whether for strategic gain or just to embarrass them. Uh, encrypted messages become increasingly important to diplomacy, and so therefore so does cryptanalysis. So it's the original red team, blue team in information security. Finally, in the 15th century, we get a new idea. Leon Battista Alberti, a Florentine polymath, lit onto a new idea. He published an essay saying, what if you use more than one alphabet? Uh-oh. Yeah. So in this one, what you would do is you would alternate between them. The first letter you would decipher using C1, or your, your, your first alphabet, and then your second letter with the second, and so on and so forth, back and forth. This introduced some new features into ciphertext that made things more challenging. First, what it did is double letters now are very misleading. If you look at the cipher text there, you can see that we've got a double G towards the end. It might be a little bit hard. It's harder to see on the screen than I figured it would, but there's a double G in here in the cipher text. You might think that that corresponds to a double letter in the plain text, but it doesn't. Conversely, if you look at the words noon and meet, those both have double letters, <coughs> which don't result in double letters in the cipher text. Also, little words now have multiple forms. The word at uh, appears twice and has two different forms. The first time it's LV, the second time it's EI. By the way, Trevi Fountain was also a project of uh, Albertis. 
This is an important innovation. It's a polyalphabetic cipher using more than one alphabet. And as important as it is, it wasn't until the 16th century that Blaise de Vigenere built on Alberti's idea and made a powerful new encryption system with them. In the Vigenere cipher, the frequency of, the, of characters in the ciphertext is not at all correlated to the frequency of characters in the plain text. So if you consider a table showing all 26 iterations of a Caesar shift, there's nothing secret about this table, by the way. It's just a tool. If you were to intercept this, you'd learn nothing. So Vigenere would use a letter in a key phrase and a letter in the plain text to determine what the ciphertext is. So let's look at a trivial example there. Secret key is cat. The, secret, uh, the, the phrase we want to encrypt is dog. So first we're going to look in the D column for the C, or yeah, in the C column for the D row. Now we're going to look in the O column for the A row. Now we're going to look in the G column for the T row. And the ciphertext is GBA. So if you were to imagine that the Vatican used this uh, after it was published to send a message about Pope Gregory's death using his predecessor Urban's name as the key, we would set it up like this. <coughs> now since the key only has five letters, we can reduce that visionaire square to just these five rows. And encrypt. All right. This is a five alphabet cipher, which is much more difficult than obviously a single, but it's still crackable. So if they were to instead announce the new pope using a longer version of Gregory's name as the key. I will skip too far. We have nine unique alphabets in a sequence of 14, in a looping sequence of 14. So this is much more difficult. Now, all you had was this one plain text. It's pretty much impossible to crack. So as much of a game changer as this was, it failed to start an overnight revolution <coughs> because it, Another type of cipher was capturing people's attention. A homophonic cipher is when where syllables are encoded instead of letters. So Louis XIV used this. Um, he called it the Great Cipher, and honestly, they thought it was so strong they believed it was truly uncrackable. And to their credit, it lasted about 250 years before someone defeated it. The problem was, it was ultimately a code. So once someone caught on that they weren't using letters, that they were using syllables, it quickly went downhill from there. Cryptanalysts jumped on top of that, tore it to pieces after that, long after they'd stopped using it. So we're going to keep rolling forward. We're going to look ahead now to August Kirchhoffs, or Kirchhoffs, I'm sorry, um, who was a 19th century professor of languages in France. So in 1883, he published a series of essays called La Cryptographie Militaire. Um, And he, he proved himself to be a great student of cryptography. His essays were some of the most important works since Alberti's. He understood the distinction between wartime crypto, which was a momentary exchange between two persons, and diplomatic crypto, which really needed to have security that was on time. So he outlined six principles, and I would read through it, but I'm cutting it close on time. So I'm going to highlight here just the second one. That the design of a system, like the algorithm, should not require secrecy. That the compromise of the system should not inconvenience the correspondence. So what he's saying is that your algorithm shouldn't be secret. It should have a key. If you lose that key, you just change it. If, you're, if the security of your system is reliant on the enemy not knowing that, su that system exists or how it works, you're going to lose. So this became important mere decades later. The Archduke Franz Ferdinand, the stylish looking guy on the left, was assassinated in Sarajevo. Mounting political tensions erupted like a powder keg, and the nations of Europe coalesced into the central power and allied powers in World War I. And they squared off on two key fronts. It was an interesting time because the great powers of the world brought the full force of their cre creativity and industry into painting the world with a new vision of hell. So despite the fact that forces were literally entrenched and advances were bloody, uh, battlefield communications were extremely important They could save lives. Imagine trying to decipher a message under these conditions, uh, under fire, shelling from the enemy. So Kirchhoff was spot on when he said one of the other six principles was that field ciphers should be easy to use. So for that reason, World War I is a study in transposition ciphers. We'll go into a couple. Here's one that the Germans used uh, exclusively, or extensively, sorry, in World War I. 
first a key would be an issue. It would normally be a longer key, but we're going through example. Now you're going to order the letters in the key. So we're first going to go by letter precedence, and then we're going to go by order of appearance. So VA is number one, T-E-R-L-A is number two. All right, now we make a grid below, and we're going to fill in the plain text of the message. Third division, uh, third division, stop, attack at daybreak, stop, gas to proceed. Right, we write it in, left to right, top to bottom. And then the cipher text is a reading of the columns according to that order sequence. So column one is H-I-K-A-R, column two is I-T-Y-S-E, and so on. Now this isn't terribly strong, so the Germans built on it. They did two rounds of it. So for the second round, we're just going to write in the output from that first round, left to right, top to bottom, so we had H-I-K-A-R, so on and so forth. All right. Now the Germans would add a number of null characters uh, at the bottom, equal to the number of words in the key phrase. So it's just one here. I guess it's really kind of a checksum when you read into it. It doesn't really add more security, per se. But now we're going to read out the columns in key order again. Sorry. Uh, so, and we show it here at the bottom in blocks of five for telegraphability. Right? So to decipher the message, they're just going to go in reverse. Right? They're going to divide the number of characters by the key length, 42 by 9. The quotient, 4, is the number of full rows, and the remainder is the number that's, or is the number of characters left in, uh, in, the, in the final row. So from there, they would just uh, reverse the process. This is much more difficult, but um, the French had superior, superior cryptanalysts, and they were all over this from the very beginning of the war. As it became apparent to the Germans that their, their crypto systems were transparent to the enemy, uh, they started experimenting with other systems at a chaotic pace. So another one that I want to point out, uh, which is it's kind of neat, our turning grill. So uh, here our message is, enemy artillery bound for your location. Right? We fill in just a couple of nulls at the end so it fits. Now they're going to overlay the key on top of that. And they're going to advance, they're going to rotate this grid clockwise until they've come full circle and it gets every character in there. So to decipher, they would just repeat the process. They'd put it in that start position and just start filling in those letters. Uh, again, the French were able to beat this, but I just thought it was actually <coughs> it's a key, It's a neat gimmick. So the, the best known failure of German crypto in the war is, of course, the, the Zimmerman telegram. So in 1917, Arthur Zimmerman, uh, who was uh, Germans, Germany's foreign secretary, he sent a telegram to Germany's ambassador to Mexico saying, hey, if the US enters the war, we would really like it if you would declare war on them. We'll give you lots of money, which they didn't have. Um, well, the British intercepted it, uh, decrypted it, and turned it over to Woodrow, Woodrow Wilson and the press. So when it hit that press, all of a sudden, the US was much more in favor of entering the war, which made a pretty big impact. But by the fall of 1918, the uh, Allied powers basically had gotten beaten back. So you ended up with the armistice of November 11, uh, which led to the Treaty of Versailles. It led to the, the abdication of the Kaiser and the founding of the German Republic. So I'm going to fly through the remainder here. I apologize. I'm going to skip one time, Pat. I'm sorry. <laughs> so I can get to Arthur Sherbius, who he founded a company in, in uh, 1918 to take on a project uh, that would improve German crypto. He built on an idea that came from an old friend of ours, Mr. Alberti. So he came up with uh, the idea of cipher disks, which were basically a cheap way of carrying around a durable, portable cipher table. You could rotate that inner disk to set it to whatever position you want. Sherbius said, why does it have to just be a shift? Why can't we totally randomize it? So he invented a rotor. That's a key word there for you. So the rotor basically randomized, had 26 inputs, 26 outputs, and it ran the, the wiring randomized. When you press the key, you press A, it's going to wire to J on the output board, it will rotate. So that if you press the same key the next time, you're not going to get the same letter. So this is kind of like having uh, Alberti's original polyalphabetic cipher, but with 26 separate alphabets. But that wasn't enough for him. So he said, OK, why don't we add more than one rotor? So he added, let's go to two. They're going to rotate like wheels in an odometer, right? So I'll go through it a couple times. 
So you can see there on the second one, only that first rotor engaged. He said, why don't we go to three? And he added this thing at the end called a reflector, which really just loops the wiring back through another path, just increases the amount of entropy you got there. And because he wasn't satisfied with the amount of entropy that created, he then added a plug board, which every day you could swap around some cables, and again, just add more chaos into the setup, make it harder to guess what the output was going to be at any time. So you've probably figured that out by now that what I'm talking about, the machine he invented, was the famous German Enigma machine. And it did a really good job of creating very uh, a lot of entropy in the amount of configurations you could put into it. Um, I, I stole uh, some information from a mathematician. I don't understand all of his calculations, but, so I'm going to take it at faith for the purpose of PowerPoint. <coughs> um, but it, apparently it had the maximum number of combinations on the order of 10 to 114. Yikes. The way the Germans used it, however, they only uh, fed it combinations up to about 10 to 23. They just limited themselves the way they did. So, as you probably know, Enigma was ultimately defeated. And I think you might have a good idea who you think defeated Enigma. Any guesses? Anyone? You're supposed to say Turing. You're supposed to say Turing, but I guess you have the sense that it's not Turing. It feels like you're leaving me off. So. <laughs> <laughs> this guy right here. Marian uh, Rayevsky. Sorry, I had to think about it a second to make sure I pronounced it correctly. Yolank has corrected me on that one before. Uh, he was a university student uh, near Poland in the 1930s. So at this point, this is prior to, to, to Hitler coming into power. Um, they just wanted to know. I mean, in, in Germany, as you recall, was, was economic disaster land. So they just wanted to know what was going on with this improving uh, crypto. So they hired him. Um, and, a, and a team of other mathematicians into the, bureau, uh, the Polish um, Intelligence Bureau to basically work on this problem. And they did solve it. They invented the concept of bombs that later Turing did use to solve it. Now what ended up happening is they cracked Enigma, but in the lead up now, later in the 30s, in 1938, Germany threw them for a loop. The original design had three rotors, and so they would arrange those rotors in Enigma every day, some arrangement of three rotors. Well, sensing that they were about to go to war, they changed it. They now they added two more rotors, so they would choose three out of five. The amount of entropy that added to the system uh, would have required more computational power than Poland could throw it. In fact, they said to, to rebuild the bombs to account for that, they would need to spend uh, 15 times the entire Polish uh, government budget on just intelligence, and they weren't able to do that. So sensing that things were about to go south, what they then took everything they had learned and they gifted that to the British, since they were right next door. And it's a good time, they, uh, it's a good time, their timing was good, because it wasn't long after that Germany began the invasion. Now, of course, Turing had his own contributions to the process. Uh, crib words were a huge victory. Um, and so he did a lot of work. He deserves all credit for being uh, the guy who led the team, who then decrypted, or who cracked Enigma with the five rotor configuration. Now, his story, all on its own, is worthy of all the time I could give it, which unfortunately is absolutely none. Um, but fortunately, Hollywood has done that for me. So if you've not taken the opportunity to go see the imitation game from last year, was that last year? I guess so. Maybe it was earlier this year. It was, it was this spring, in fact. Um, I highly recommend it. Uh, there's a lot that they get right. Uh, Ryevsky doesn't get a, even an honorable mention, unfortunately. It is a little bit uh, uh, English-centric, but that's OK. They do a fantastic job with the story. Uh, his contributions even go outside cryptography. So. I had a, an extra chapter here, but I am absolutely out of time. Um, so if you like, this will, this stuff will be in the slides that get distributed. Uh, there's a lot of animations in here, so if you want to see just a couple really, really basic building blocks in, in modern crypto, check out the slides as they're distributed. Um, are there any questions? If not, then thank you very much for <laughs>